Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Good morning for some of you. Uh, this is my great pleasure to, um, I would say, to celebrate women. This month was the month where uh, we, uh, uh, in, uh, in the pure tradition of our fungo British Chamber, we are celebrating women. Uh, and I'm extremely pleased uh, to welcome our two guests. Uh, I was just discussing and interacting with uh, Marion. Um, should I present you, Marion? I'm not <laughs> sure for French people. Uh, you're a legend of Wimbledon uh, and uh, you're representing so well, so well French, uh, you know, sports and, um, you know, your career has been just absolutely tremendous, spectacular. So many people were proud of you uh, and we all keep in mind you know, some of your fantastic games. Uh, well, thanks for uh, all the emotion you delivered to uh, not only French people, but I would say overall uh, people who, who love tennis. So right now, after tennis, uh, you spend your time between Paris, Dubai, and London. Um, I was told that you developed uh, coaching activity, but you're also a multi-entrepreneur um, developing, you know, um, uh, some specific element uh, in complement mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to the normal one, okay? And obviously, we just uh, show a future uh, championship uh, with Camilia, who's just practicing on the on the court right now. So, yes. uh, thank you very much for being with us and for accepting to share uh, your experience. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be extremely inspiring for all of us. And I'd like also to welcome. Claire, Claire Walker. Uh, good evening, uh, Claire. Uh, Claire, I'm very pleased also to have you uh, part uh, of this session. Uh, you are the co-CEO of the uh, network of uh, British uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, you are uh, highly educated, yeah, involved into uh, education for children. You will talk about it. Uh, and uh, you were previously CEO of... Uh, uh, different um, uh, non-profitable organization uh, such as uh, Teach First. Um, and uh, you will share your experience as an intense uh, professional life, but also at the same time trying to balance your uh, life as, uh, as a mother, uh, as uh, taking care uh, of, uh, of your family. Uh, so uh, I think it's going to be extremely interesting to, to share both uh, your uh, experience. So thank you again for uh, being uh, with us tonight. It's really my great pleasure for, for with our team. And we agreed with your team that we're going to have interactions. So um, the best is uh, to start with some questions. And after, you know, uh, uh, this discussion, uh, we're going to have some Q&A session with uh, the auditorium, but also at the same time with people, uh, you know, online, because it's a kind of a hybrid uh, period and um, normal life is still on the way to come not yet but it's gonna it's gonna come one day it's gonna come so um maybe um we can start uh, with uh, the first uh, question uh, related to um uh, remarkable progress that was made uh, in achieving promoting promoting gender equality in the countries uh, we live in uh, yet major uh, qualities remain in the work and business environment. And I'd like to ask each of you, what challenges have you faced in building your own career? Because you had to deal with so many, so many challenges, so many, I would say, uh, difficulties, but also even that could have impacted your, uh, uh, your professional life and your life. Maybe we can start with you, Marion. Yes, of course. Well, first of all, uh, I'm really honored to be part of that poll and, uh, and to share my experience with you. I obviously, as you say, Thierry, I have sort of two lives. Um, of course, as a professional tennis player and, and playing my career for 15 years and, and being on a tennis court, being a, a female athlete, which is always more challenging than being a male athlete, especially in a world where male tennis is really dominating with you know, the era of Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic just taking the whole spotlight. So being able to 
emerge as a woman athlete was definitely a major challenge. And then now, obviously, still facing those challenges in, in the different businesses, I'm um, involved as an entrepreneur. Uh, as you said, as you mentioned, as a diet company and a diet business, I'm trying to build from the ground go. And of course, as a woman tennis coach as well, which is not really happening often in the tennis world, which is still very much dominating by male tennis coach. I would say what the changes I really face the most is the difference in terms of price money, which is the equivalency of a monthly wage that could be in a normal business. Um, we're still up until 2007 when actually Wimbledon would, would have been the first pioneer to give equal price money for the winner and throw out the draw. It was the first year in 2007 when I reached the final of Wimbledon, losing to Venus Williams. That was the first ever Grand Slam in the history of tennis, distributing the same price money for male and female. And it was done by Wimbledon. And obviously, as a progress, the other Grand Slam start to follow, not straight away. But by 2013, we were all equal in four Grand Slam. But it's only four tournaments. And it's by far not throughout the year when you know on a normal schedule, you would play around 20 tournaments. So 16 of them as a female athlete, you still less pay than a male athlete. Now there is always this debate saying, yes, but the females they don't play the best of five sets. We, you guys only play the best of three sets, which is completely unfair because obviously we all know that naturally and genetically, the men's are just have more muscle mass, are just stronger than female. Because if you look at ancestor and ancestor, woman was more made to have children and the men's were going out to work. That was the way the whole civilization was built. Now, obviously moving forward, the woman now has a more, much higher impact into this world, but we still don't have the same muscle strength and same stamina to go and sustain five sets for seven matches. And that's the only still arguments the men's are able to raise, not all of them, but some of them still, because they, they feel they should have still the biggest pie of the cake, which is for me completely unfair because as a female athlete, you train as hard as them, you're doing the same amount of hours, you're spending as much as them, you still have to pay for your tennis coach, you have to pay for your physio, you have to pay for your fitness coach, you have the same expenses year long, and yet you're definitely earning less money than them. And that's still those hurdles we're just having to face that you know, in, in the common sense, men should earn more money than women's. And, and that just drives me crazy because as an athlete, we put so much effort into what we're doing daily at the same level as a man. And therefore we absolutely deserve to get the same paycheck. Mm -hmm. Then you can debate whether tennis worth that much money. That's another debate. But I, I don't understand still why there is such inequality in the year long price money shared between the ATP and the WTA. So that's a constant conversation I'm having with the WTA CEO to try to bring that to the table more into the media because in the media phase, they did so much buzz around the equal price money on the Grand Slams. Then in the common sense of people, it's equal price money year long because obviously the Grand Slams are the tournaments are the more exposed on TV and on social media and just having more viewers. And because they heard, oh, it's equal price money there, then they think it's equal price money year long, which is absolutely not the case. So that's a whole education we're still trying to bring at the table. But obviously my career was from 2001 to 2013. And that big chunk of it until 2007 was by far not at all equal price money. So I had to fight so much to win a lot of matches to get enough price money year long so I could pay for my coaches and all my expenses and all that. And obviously that helped me a lot to carry that mindset into now the business I'm driving because I learned how to fight and stand up for myself. And just, you know, sit up into a, a room full of men when I have to sell my products and just being, having enough sort of, not ego in a bad way, but, you know, enough demeanor and just character to just go out there and say, well, this is the best product you would find in the market. And even though I'm a woman developing it, that doesn't mean I don't have, you know, this, the sense of business or common sense to develop a product or work ethic because I'm a mother and I, I just have constantly to prove it, which is not something a man would have to prove. But my, you know, one of my biggest mentors is Richard Branson, and he has obviously given me a lot of advice and tips on business and all of that. And he's just always say to myself, if you have a business idea that's going to change the life of someone, then it's a great idea. 
And that's where for me, my diet project can change the life of so many who are struggling with their weight and with their body image and just, you know, are afraid to go out because they don't want to be judged by people. And, and I can have an impact on their lives and I can change their lives. That's why I, I have, I'm so much believing into what I'm doing right now because I believe I can change the life of some people and that's why driving me. And I don't take a no for answer. So I will come back and come back and come back until I get my market and I am where I want to be. So that, that's really what I learned throughout my tennis career. It's to constantly fight for what you want and what you want to achieve. And until you get there, you just don't quit. So that was really the main things I've learned from my tennis career that I can implement now into my business uh, adventures. Very interesting, Mario. And we, we can feel this energy and this yeah. fighting spirit in your voice, in your body language. And by the way, probably it was one of the reasons when you were on the court, never, never consider it the end of the game. Always, always fight. And, and I really believe that for all of us, it's really a, a source of, uh, of inspiration. Thank you for sharing that. Claire, maybe you can uh, uh, well, share your own experience uh, as will. a professional as a, a mother. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so thrilled to be here with Marion. I have to say, I have spoken at many, many events and none of them have got my team as excited as to hear that I'm sharing this event with Marion because they're such fans, even in England, um, <laughs> of, your fabulous, um, of your fabulous tennis. And I'm a huge Wimbledon fan, so I was extremely pleased when Wimbledon made that decision for uh, equal pay um, in... Uh, too, I mean, it took too long, but at least that was that first step forward. So my name's Claire. I'm co-executive director at the British Chamber of Commerce. The first thing to say about me is that my leadership journey for the last eight years has been deeply entwined with someone else. So although um, I am co-executive director, I'm wholly responsible for the work that we do at the British Chamber of Commerce. Like in the tennis world, I have a doubles partner. I have mm -hmm. someone that I share my role with. Um, so three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I work flat out. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, my partner works flat out. And then we share weekends and holidays. And we've done this for a number of reasons. First of all, because at our level, it's incredibly fast paced, incredibly demanding. And before COVID would involve an awful lot of travel, as I'm sure Marion understands. Um, but equally, uh, working together as a partnership has enabled us to achieve much, much more than we would have done um, alone. But also, it has meant that we have been able to have the strength and the bravery to go into sectors uh, that uh, are very male dominated. And I think that although uh, being the most senior job share in job share is how it is described, a job share. Um, in the UK and uh, has been difficult to establish ourselves, to make sure that people understand the way that we work, to make sure that people work with both of us, not just one of us, has been difficult. Actually, it would be far harder to be in some of the conversations that we have had and some of the uh, decisions that we've had to make over the last four years um, in this current role and then previously in the last four years without each other. And I think we really recognize the value that it does. And I would like to share a story before I talk about the challenges about some of the benefits of, of being this very senior level job share. As you know, we, we left the European Union a few years ago and there was a big document that came, uh, which was called the Withdrawal Agreement and it happened to land on a Wednesday, a day when both me and my partner work. And we split the document in half. We took half each and we started analyzing it. Then one of us had to go and speak to the media about it. The other one then had to go and speak to the government about it. So complete coverage all the time on what we're doing. But the next day, it was one of my days with my children and I went and dropped my eldest child at school and then my youngest child was with me all day and then we went to have friend be with a friend um, in the park and the parents of those uh, friends said uh, what's Brexit? So I'd had this incredible high level experience analyzing the text 
But then I just had a regular conversation with people that weren't involved in anything to do with my day to day and didn't even understand what was going on in the country. And I get both experiences and that really helps me um, uh, go forward and, 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 um, and think about how things are very important to some people, but actually the vast majority of, of people might not be involved in the detail. And it's really helped shape my thinking and my leadership. Um, I'd say one of the big challenges that I've experienced is actually not overt sexism. It's not people being, you know, as, uh, you know uh, being clearly sexist. It's the small, tiny little things. It's very, very hard to put your finger on, taking slightly less time to come to you in a meeting or coming to you last, forgetting your name, but not forgetting the men. I think those are the types of things day in, day out that women experience. When I started my career, actually there was quite a lot of sexism in, the, in, 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 in business, but now things have changed. That has, that has rightly been despaired, but there's still such tiny challenges um, which are hard to put your finger on. Um, and we must constantly challenge those to make sure that we have an inclusive environment for all. And the last thing that I was going to say is, is a campaign that BCC has led with other business groups in the UK. And in order to register a company in this, in this country, uh, the registered articles are still described as a chairman. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've tried to do is we've tried to remove that. So it's just gender neutral and it's chair. And unfortunately, there are many, many people that have chosen that it should stay as it is, um, rather than remove any kind of chairwoman, chairman uh, from, the, from them. They want, they want it to keep uh, as chairman. So we still have a very long way to go on that journey to equality. But I'm delighted to start this conversation here today because the more that we talk about these issues, the harder it is for us to not make progress. Very interesting to share your views, uh, Claire. Uh, and uh, if, if I may, I'd like to switch to, uh, to business. We all know and we can see that more and more businesses uh, are being created. And uh, Marion, you're a great example by a woman as entrepreneur. Uh, but interesting enough, figures, when you look at the figures, the figures show that women's business have more difficulty accessing financing than those run by men, exactly to what you say, Marion. Uh, but on the other hand, women's business generates twice as much revenue and are less likely to fail. So it's interesting to see this gap, okay? Uh, and I hope moving forward, we're gonna see more uh, balancing world. So uh, I'd like to ask you, what do you think are the main qualities necessary to, for the independent leading woman's journey that you have each built? It's really in the way you built your businesses what are the main qualities that makes you succeeding in your business unique and making the difference comparing to a male? Should I start, Thierry? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so I would say for me, incredible work ethic. So you have to be able, especially as a woman and especially as a mother, to put your days into different classifications. So you have to, as Claire was doing, just, I can't give full days when I'm not working. I don't have that flexibility, but I need certain number of hours I only dedicated to my child and my family. And those hours, phone is forbidden, email is forbidden, and I'm just standing with my family and do my duties and what I have to do. And then there's some hours when I just, I know I have to work and those I sort of have one corner of an eye on my daughter, but I'm 95% engaged into my business and what I'm doing. And those hours are extremely long and extended because I know there is, you know, four or five hours or even six hours a day I'm dedicated to my family and I have to catch back on those hours. So that's why I'm doing 17 hours of work every day. And I can't take a day off. I don't have that luxury because I have too many roles everywhere, but I, I know I can't go under that amount of hours. So I'm ready to sort of sacrifice 
some time for myself that I can't put in in order to put it for my family, for my daughter, for my husband. So incredible work ethic because I know otherwise I won't be able to get where I want to be. The second is integrity. I will never compromise my integrity. So I will never go with you know, a dodgy partner or something I don't have a, a good gut feeling for. I will always go with the right path, even if it's slightly trickier. So let's say you know, I need a mortgage or some sort of money from a bank and maybe someone else, a sort of dodgy investors or something based on who I am would give me and lend me that money. I will never do that. I will keep my integrity and go the hard way to prove my business model and to prove that what I'm doing is right to get a, to land a proper mortgage or proper money investments from either um, a venture program or some sort of you know business investors, but to do things the right way. And the third part, which is again coming back to what I've said on the tennis scales, it just never take a no. Um, I will come back and come back and come back at you until you give me a yes. And whatever is lacking, you tell me and I will fix it until I get a yes. And you know, I'm in talk with, let's say, Boots Pharmacy, with Olin and Barrett, with Planet Organic in the UK. And whatever they're looking now and they say, oh, we need slightly more SKUs into your business or we need that food as well on the keto side and whatever and whatever, I will fix it, but I will never give up. I will not say, oh, okay, maybe the UK market is too difficult. I'm gonna approach another market for now and I will leave this one on the side until you know I'm bigger and I have more, more money to invest into my business and I can get to another market. I will never do that. I will keep on fixing stuff with my team until I get it right. And the fourth thing, which I believe it's really important is to be a leader. So you have to pave the way for your team and you have to be the example for your team. And that comes with showing the dedication and showing the amount of work. Um, you know, it's just, you are an example for them. And if you're a bad example, that would not perform well. So I believe I'm the leader of, of my products. I have to behave that right way. And I have to show them the dedication, the amount of work, the research, everything I'm doing so they can follow my path and, and have the same drive with me. So those are really the four things I'm implementing, which are obviously extremely similar to uh, you know, high level of sports because you're building a team around you and you're the, the ownership of your small business, which is you know, your fitness coach, your tennis coach, your physio, and whoever is traveling with you, that's your small team. So I was used to that and I can definitely implement that into my business um, journey now. Question, just to continue on this point, uh, Marion, because it's extremely interesting. Uh, as a leader, you're uh, shaping a team. Yeah. And within your team, when you decide to hire a, a person to create value within your team, what are you expecting from this person as a woman? So it's very interesting because in my team right now, we have four women for three men. So we have actually more women than men. I'm looking for them to have the same passion as me in the products. So they have to know the business as much as I do. So even though, so to, to be very clear, what I'm doing is some keto diet products, which are some of them are pills to take, some others are food, keto food products, but they, even though they're not, maybe not following the keto diet, they have to know it as good as me which is I'm following the keto diet. So they have to have a full understanding of how that diet functions so they can speak about it with the same passion as I do. Because if they have an interaction with the buyers, you know, and I'm not on the call, they have to be able to speak at the same level of engagement and passion as I do. So that is really crucial for me. And then understanding very quickly what I'm saying to them. So I need sharp minds to understand my vision and put it in action. So that's really what I'm looking for into when I'm hiring someone, whether it's a male or female, I just don't, you know, it's the same quality I'm looking for. It's, it's really integrated people that are ready to work the right way. Don't take shortcuts, just do it the right way. Knowing the business inside out and then being able obviously to put the hours and follow my lead. But, but those are really the three qualities I'm looking for. Very interesting. So it's a pure alignment between vision, strategy and execution. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great. Claire. Well, I never, knew that, I never knew that there was so much alignment between elite sports people and then job sharers as well, because it, it's when I hear Marion speak, it's so much of uh, the way that we've managed to make our partnership a success. So at, at the heart, there's 
core values that we agreed right at the start about how we treat people, how we operate, um, how we behave. Um, and we've managed to define them as um, a, a purpose around people and partnerships. And those are the three things that we define how we operate. And that's the consistency between when you have two people working, that's the consistency between us. At the heart of what makes us work though is a partnership that's full of trust, that's about the fact that I trust her with my entire job and she trusts me with her entire job. And that's very unusual, and quite hard for people to get understanding, but in the same way, if you're on a tennis court, you have to make that decision with a doubles player um, and you have to make that trust. And, and I truly believe that she will catch those balls and she will um, bat them back. And that's, that's very uh, true. <coughs> The other thing that's made us really successful is there wasn't a book on how to be a really, really senior job sharer. We, we didn't know. Uh, there was no one out there that had been at this level and, and done it the way that we had. So we, we looked at all the information that we had out there and we looked at what we could learn from that. But, but then we also thought, how can we make this better? How can we make it better for ourselves? How do we improve ourselves? How do we improve our process? And then how do we support other partnerships coming up, junior partnerships who want to do something similar to be um, better and how can we share our learning and how can we, um, how we can um, make a difference. And then last but not least, and very similar to Marion, we never took no for an answer. Uh, we, when people said it was impossible to do this, we, that was just a challenge for us. Okay, it was impossible to share a role or it was impossible to truly have a high level career and then have a couple of days completely focused on the children. And for us, that was really important, a driving factor to say that there was a different way, that there was a different way of making things work that meant that you could combine a really high profile career with uh, working three three days plus a weekend um, uh, every other weekend. You know, there was, there was a way to make it happen. And I think that drove us on, similar to Marion. I always like it when people say no to us because then that makes us work harder. Very interesting. You know, listening to you, Claire, and, and, and also back to uh, what Marion shared with us, it's interesting because I remember a day uh, as um, CEO of Cisco, I was uh, in a way to promote somebody. And on one side, there were a man, and on the other side, a woman. And I decided to have a, a meeting with each of them, just to say, I'm thinking about promoting you. It's going to be the role of your life or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Reaction from the man was, sure. Because my question was, you feel it? You think you can make it? And uh, yeah, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the one. I'm the one. I'm your guy. I'm going to make it happen. You know what? I'm the one. And just after I had the discussion with the woman, and the woman listening and told me, Thierry, do you really sure I can make it happen? Guess what was my choice? Okay, so explaining that it's just a difference in terms of uh, promoting your talent, your expertise, your added value. So it's very interesting because sometimes you have to push you just to say, okay, yes, I can make it also, okay? And... Uh, and it's a great example of positioning between the man and the woman. And uh, it's, uh, it just came to my, to my mind. So Marianne, Claire, uh, you are two great examples of um, female leadership. Uh, and I'm interested to, if you could describe with us um, your, 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 your this leadership uh, and uh, how would you promote it? Uh, how would you teach it? Because back to my example, we as men, we, I would say, we have more facility to say, I can, I can. Yes, I can make it. Yes, I'm the man. Yes, I'm the one. Yes, I can do that, 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 that. You, as women, we have to push you because your tendency is not to make your own promotion, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm interested if you could share with our team uh, some advice and how you believe 
you can promote it and really push the envelope into this area. Yeah, it, it's definitely not an easy question to answer. It's, it's also very much depending on your own character and, and whether you're naturally more leader or naturally more follower. Um, but I would say that as a woman, we have to believe more in our potential. And, and that comes a lot with the education you have received. And I believe that, you know, I, I grew up obviously idolizing my father uh, who coached me in tennis and, and brought me where I was. But he always gave me that sense of I have some values and, and that value was high. And therefore, I should stand tall for myself and I should be proud of what I was achieving and doing. And I believe very much that sometimes, you know, as an education, the boys are always more pushed higher and the girls sort of, you know, stand back. And, and the parents have, you know, needs to stand that role and to have that role of, of being that same platform to their girls as well, which is obviously what I'm going to fight for with all my strengths and my passion for my daughter, that, that she deserves to be treated the same way as a boy. And, and she has, for me, obviously the same value, not even higher than a boy. And, and that gives you that sort of strength and inner strength to come and stand up for yourself. And yes, to accept high level of stress or high demanding jobs which are senior levels like Claire or, you know, me playing a Wimbledon final and having to step out on that court and go and win that final. You need to have a certain um, amount of value for yourself and recognize that you will be able to achieve that. And that comes along from the education. And that's where for me school is very much integrated with the path of women towards that leadership process. And, and school varies very much depending on the countries on putting the girls up. And that's where for me, France is not doing a, so much of a good job because when you see in the classes, the way you know girls are treated, it's, it's very much constantly boys. When you look at the highest level of school or university in France, such as Matsup, Matspay, Polytechnic, you know, all those big universities that give you to lead, lead jobs, you're filled most of the time by men. And that's where I believe that we need also to make that change and to give women more spots into those huge university for them to build those skills, to be able to stand up on themselves and accept high level of stress and responsibility jobs into the future. Um, but I was extremely lucky to be built up by some parents who always had extremely high values into girls and into child, you know, we were treated obviously the same way with my brother, but I was not left aside. I was constantly just, you know, put into the spotlight and my parents was very encouraging into what I was doing. Um, so in that part, in that sense, I was extremely lucky. But my, my advice would be for those girls who probably or maybe didn't have the same luck as I did, is to find ways to do stuff where they feel extremely comfortable and where they feel they really belong there. And whatever that might be, could be arts, could be music, could be sports, could be business, whatever that is, there is not one way or better way, it's just their way. But when they feel comfortable into something, then they go for it 100%. Because sometimes, you know, women decide to choose a career that they're not extremely passionate about just because they have to do something and they feel they have to do something. And that's where they probably struggle a bit more than the men's. But if they do something they're extremely passionate about and whatever that might be, that's where they can stand tall for themselves. And, um, and that's what I highly believed in. And you know, for my daughter, that's what I would encourage her to do is choose something that you feel so passionate about that it doesn't seem like work. It's just your passion you're doing every day. And, and for me, that's exactly what I feel when I'm coaching those kids today on the court. It's not work for me. It's just my passion that I express. When I do business, it's not work for me. It's just I'm passionate and I'm ambitious. And I just bring that ambition into what I feel it's good for you know, other people because I can help them into the diet, into their lives into their body image. So it's not a work for me, it's a passion. When you treat something as a passion and not a work anymore, that's where you're winning. Very interesting. It's really a question about making your choice for exactly. you and build confidence on it. And it's, it will help you to really continue to develop and to be the best in your uh, in your Guilt. own development, which is exactly. uh, which is just absolutely key. Claire, Sorry. if you can Hold just me. put your Hold mic on. on, 
Pardon, yeah, pardon. Um, so I think the first thing is around what Hannah and I, so my partner and I have done to encourage uh, other partnerships. We pull together a pack. We tweet about our partnership all the time. We've written lots of articles. We've actually done a podcast, uh, which is uh, in French, which is on our LinkedIn. We've done lots to encourage people to think of a different way of leadership and a different way of working. And we continue to um, represent uh, partnerships at the highest levels. We were recently named um, two of the top 100 women in Westminster, which is obviously our our, our political um, sphere. And that was the first job shares to ever have made the list. So we're incredibly proud of the impact that we make. I think there's a second one is around um, recognizing that some women, not all women, have different leadership styles. And that if you are a company looking um, to truly promote women, because we know that's better for business um, to have equal numbers, then actually you might be looking for different leadership qualities and different uh, ways of presenting uh, the fact uh, that they are leadership ready. And true leaders like yourself uh, recognize that actually they do present differently. Um, and we need to make sure that actually we're selecting, we're not asking people to present in a way that means that they are ruled out at interview, but actually potentially might be better at the job um, down the line because of how they present and their own personalities and potentially their genders. And just to, to reiterate uh, Marion's point, you know, I have two daughters. Uh, we have gone a very long way in terms of education in this country, but I am choosing to educate my eldest daughter who is now at secondary, I don't know what you call it in France, but uh, secondary school um, in a single sex school. And there is a reason for that. She's highly scientific. She's highly mathematic. And actually girls don't tend to do very well when there are in those subjects, uh, when men and boys potentially think that they are much better at those subjects than girls. So we need to think about how we educate girls as well as boys, it has to be both, to get the best out of both sexes uh, and for all subjects and not have what happened to me, which was girls can't be scientific, girls can't be mathematic, um, and send them down different paths, which actually they may not be their true passion. And I think if you do find your true passion, uh, then actually you don't feel like it's work. Today hasn't been work. Today has been just talking to some wonderful people and doing something mm -hmm. that I love, you know? Great. Maybe we, we, we're going to switch um, to, to the last question. Um, I'm interested because you are two great examples. So uh, if you could share with us two examples of female leadership you admire and explain uh, why. And, um, and at the end of the day, um, if there is one message that you would like to deliver to the team, so two examples of female that you, have, you admire, that probably has been guide for you, guidance, and some advice that one advice you would like to give to people that are listening to you. So two two female leaders, uh, I would say Oprah. For me, is is a massive massive yeah. example because Oprah Winter. Uh, yeah, absolutely. She just built a true empire and with so much passion again about what she's doing and, and this ability to tell stories, um, you know, that there's just so inspiring and, and you get, when you watch, um, you know, any, any sort of anything she has done, any show she has done, you're just captivated by, by the way she's interviewing people and stuff. And the second one for me is Serena Williams. Um, the way her story was obviously with Venus, but now the way she has built the whole business around her second passion, which is fashion and jewelry. And, you know, the way she presents herself again as a mother and as an entrepreneur, as one of the best players that ever played the game coming from Compton. And I think everyone saw her movie done by Will Smith, who obviously got the Oscar yesterday night. Um, the whole story is so inspiring to see that whatever the challenges exactly that what Claire said you can overcome them if you have that passion that drive that will 
Um, and for me, she's a true example of absolutely that. So those are really my role models that I'm trying to obviously, you know, not copying my life on, but trying to get inspired by. And uh, and obviously, I was lucky enough to share the tennis court of several occasions with Serena Williams, and um, and talk to her as a friend as well, and share um, you know tips and advice and on on our business now. So um, those are really my my two uh, high level models that I do have. And your second question, Thierry. Sorry, my I didn't second finish. question was, if you would like to leave uh, us with one advice. To yeah. the people listening to you, what would it be based on your experience? Never give up. I'm not so surprised. <laughs> never give up. Just never give up. That that's just it sounds simple, but it's not actually easy yeah. to put in application on a daily basis because it's it's easier to sort of give up when it's past sounds too hard, but just never give up. When you do, when you actually really do that with the true sincerity, the the sky is the limit. I mean, really, you can do a lot in, in this world right now when you can have access to social media and platforms like that, when you can touch so many people around you. Uh, you know, you can build even a whole business on Instagram those days when, when everything you publish is free. And if you have the clever idea and the right idea and everything, you have seen business just exploding through COVID-19 uh, with, you know, being on Instagram or Facebook or whatever social media platform. And just having one great idea, trying to set it, and it becomes a whole business. So you can really, definitely, never give up on your dreams and what you want to achieve. Claire, well, I have two. One's very famous. One's probably less famous for uh, for uh, uh, those of you in France. So obviously, Michelle Obama is a huge inspiration. I think she held that position with such grace. She used uh, her intelligence to further girls' education. Um, and she was from the wrong side of Chicago uh, and no one would have expected her to end up in the White House, but she taught us all um, how to behave. And I always remember her, um, her message when she was getting heavily attacked, you know, when they go low, we go high. And I think that's a good, it's a good, a good way to behave. The other one is a, a woman called Harriet Harman, who is a, a, a member of parliament uh, in the UK. She was uh, uh, my, my constituency MP, so my MP for my area for a very long period of time. Um, she joined uh, parliament in 1983 and she will be standing down at the next election. And she really? has seen, um, such change, uh, but has been consistent in her views to drive for, forward um, uh, change across every single sector uh, for women's equality. And uh, she's now defined as the mother of the house in the UK. So that's the female MP with the longest sitting legacy. And I think she has uh, inspired so many people, but she works across all parties, across all uh, sectors and across the house, as we describe it, with the other party to, to drive forward um, women's uh, women's views in politics, which I think is really important. Um, I think uh, the bit of advice that I would uh, give is to think creatively. I never thought I would end up in a you know a very established partnership leading an organisation, but uh, you know actually if you are determined to be the best at what you can do then thinking creatively is the way that you can drive success. And um, I've learned so much through working in partnership that I never thought that I would ever uh, think of. Uh, and uh, I'm, I think be open, think creatively, be creative is, is the way forward and uh, helps drive that change you want to see. That's absolutely great. Thank you so much. Maybe we can, um, well, many thanks for, and. A warm thank you for for sharing your thought, sharing your experience, and we can feel, we can and all feel a lot of uh, passion, emotion, but at the same time very very authentic. So many thanks for that. Uh, maybe uh, we can take a couple of questions from the room or from the floor, uh, Catherine or Diane. Uh, no. From the chat, there is no question yet. I, I actually have a question, if I may. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so unfortunately, you can't see me. I'm, I'm behind the laptop who's uh, leading the, 
I mean the, the Zoom. But uh, I have a question for Marion. Uh, Marion, mm -hmm. uh, thank, uh, first, thank you very much for everybody to for this uh, interview, for this 30 minute with It was very good, very, very interesting and very inspiring. And uh, Marion, I know you, you run a coaching activity and, and I would like to know if uh, it was important for you to, to be a female teacher coach to inspire and train young women and maybe less young women. And uh, if so, uh, when you train those young girls, uh, do you keep in mind this, uh, this, all these genders, inequalities, and if you try to adjust your behaviors uh, when you talk and maybe explain things to her? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for this question. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate by coaching because I love to just give back what I've learned. And, uh, and obviously tennis gave me so much and, you know, learn me so much how to behave on the court and how to handle myself and all of that, that I, I really felt when that uh, family came to approach me in Dubai and say to me, well, look, we have those two kids, one girl and one boy. They are massive dreams to be one day Grand Slam champion. Uh, I talked to those kids. They told me we dreamed about it. We live about it. We breathe about it. That's all we want to do of our life. I obviously couldn't refuse to do not help them. So I'm coaching them five hours a day, six days a week. So that's 30 hours weekly. Um, so they're going to school. So we start 5 p.m. We finish at 10 p.m. every night, six nights, six uh, days a week. So it's obviously a huge commitment from everyone, from them, obviously, and for myself as well. Um, I talked the psychology of a girl at tennis court is slightly different um, because girls are, are just feeling the emotion in a different way. It doesn't mean we are more emotional. It's just that we, means we feel the emotion in a different way. And, and therefore I interact with her in a slightly different way, but there is not so much of a change, but I'm, I'm extremely strict, but in a good way, obviously, because professional level, tennis level is extremely difficult. And there is just so many kids for so little that are gonna actually succeed and become one day Grand Slam champions. Your odds are probably one over a hundred thousand. So if you're not that special kid, and if you're not that special person, you'd stand not much of a chance to succeed at that level of you know, difficulty and, and being a Grand Slam champion one day. But I'm giving them everything I learned myself, everything that my father obviously gave me and teach me. And um, we were in Greece last week. Uh, Palavi, which is the girl for her first ever tournament, qualified and reached a quarterfinal, where she's two years younger than the other kids. She's only 12 and she played against kids who are 14 years old. So it's, she's obviously already starting to see her result and her improvement. So it's great for her and obviously it's great for me, but she knows the past is gonna be extremely long. But what I want to give them is actually life skills. More importantly, aside from just being a tennis coach, it's just those life skills on how to you know, interact with an adult, how to speak, how to handle herself on the court. When the other opponent is cheating on the ball to stand up for herself, if, the ball, if she feels her ball is in and she's getting rubbed, how to stand up for herself, how to behave the right way on the court on her own judgments of the ball and to do not steal a ball or never cheat back. So it's, it's all of that I'm teaching her as life skills, you know, how to respect people, how to behave in the right way, how to have integrity, how to give your best every single day when you're on a tennis court. And I believe those life skills, whatever might happen on the tennis court, are really shaping their futures for whatever they want to, to achieve, whether it's in tennis or something else. And, and that's where my role, I take it very seriously because obviously they trust me and they trust my judgments. So I have to be, again, that leader and lead them with example. So when we say a time on the practice court, I have to be on time on that practice court. I'm not gonna be the one showing up five minutes late because you know I'm a Grand Slam champion and I can afford to be five minutes late. If I ask them to be on time, I have to be myself on time. If I ask them in tournament to be on the court at 7.30 in the morning, I have to be on that court at 7.30 in the morning myself. So I, we lead by example, and obviously the, the best example I'm giving them, the better they will behave and, and hopefully they will succeed and, and chase their dreams. Thank you so much for your answer. I, I have a quick question if you, if you don't mind. Yes, um, yes, yeah. Diane, I'm very sorry for my COVID voice. I have to apologize. Um, and I have to thank you for your great um, talks, very inspiring, and it's just, Wonderful to benefit from your insights, both of you. Um, I have a question that's quite tricky for both of you. And um, if you don't have enough time to answer it now, maybe we can answer it, I don't know, next time. But let's say, just 
picture that you are elected and tomorrow you are part of, let's say, the British government for Claire, or you are part of the French government for Marion. So you become state secretary or minister, as we say. What would be the first measure, the first law you would take for gender equality or to women, uh, sorry, to promote, let's say, women leadership or entrepreneurship? It's a tricky question. <laughs> Should I go? Okay, you want yeah, to start? Yeah, you go. Mine's very controversial, so, uh, <laughs> so, so it's probably not BCC position. Well, for me, the first major things I will do straight away is to stop having disparity in the salary, the monthly salary. So for the same job, I will not accept a company or a brand, whoever that might be, to pay a woman less. That is absolutely impossible, and that's not acceptable. So that would be my first already low, say, you have the same job, the same level, you get the same pay mm -hmm. as me. Mm -hmm. Don't pay. Then second for me is the, the maternity leave. You know, often the women are really scared about taking maternity leave, and they feel should I get pregnant? Should I not? Because if I leave my job for a year or something, I might not find it again. That is completely unacceptable. Completely mm -hmm. unacceptable. Especially those days when you can work on Zoom or do work from your home with your computer. There is absolutely no way with me that a company or a brand or whoever that might be might get away with just saying to someone who takes a maternity leave, saying, well, well, you know what? Actually, if you do that, we might fire you. That is just absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. so that's the first already two major things I would straight away do. Um, I, so in this country, we don't have a minister of women as a standalone job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we do have a minister of women, it's our foreign secretary, but she also has a very busy job doing being a uh, foreign secretary. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the thing that I would do is make that a standalone position, a secretary, a very senior level job uh, in our cabinet. Uh, we call it, it's our uh, top government. And um, I would say that every law has to be signed off uh, by um, uh, that individual and every rule, every regulation. And I know that would be very bureaucratic. It would take a very long time. But I think people would then start thinking along the uh, mode of, uh, of how to improve laws. Um, what we saw through the pandemic was that men, uh, academics posted more. Uh, they had more uh, academic papers. Uh, they wrote more documents. And women's academic uh, papers stopped almost entirely because they were homeschooling the children. And I also think there's a conversation that we need to have with men, which is that you need to step up. You need to make sure that it's an equal load and that you need to think about uh, you driving your own career forward and the impact that has on your partner as well. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things together would be really important. Great, thank you. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. I wish you, uh, all of you a, a, a nice evening. Uh, thanks for sharing. It was a great moment for, for all of us, for, for sure. And, uh, and keep your passion and keep yeah. on pushing. Okay. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank Merci you, Claire. Thank you. Take care. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.